All right, if you guys want to take out your Bibles and head to the 37th chapter of Jeremiah, that's where we're going to be today as we continue our study through the prophecy of Jeremiah. As you guys meander that way, I want to give uh, a few moments to some Parkland Chapel building and ground improvements that will hopefully uh, be for your own good, but I'll start out with something for my good. Hopefully my good translates into your good. Uh, the parsonage has been without uh, properly functioning septic since about the turn of the year. And so after a lot of wrangling with the county and the state, uh, by the Lord's provision, there is actually equipment in my backyard putting in a brand new world-class septic system so that we can flush toilet paper. That's nice. Um, secondly, uh, there is a, a kitchen being installed. We've started the process down on the north end of the building. That would be uh, on the other side of the children's church. And so it's kind of going to be a galley style kitchen. It's not the world's largest kitchen or the world's nicest kitchen. But uh, as opposed to no kitchen, it's pretty fantastic. So <laughs> we're uh, starting that process and hopefully in the next uh, month we'll have that done and uh, that'll be very helpful for all of the dinners and the different things that go on here. And then uh, we've known for a couple years that the bathroom situation has been less than adequate so uh, there's already a pile of gravel right out those double doors waiting to blow out these bathrooms that are here and expand them. Uh, I think ladies you're getting five stalls instead of two. Think, man, you're getting three urinals and two stalls, but the biggest improvement will be when you step through the door, you don't have to awkwardly touch everyone to get to said stalls. <laughs> yeah. So, um, Bible says a lot about holy kisses, but not rubbing inappropriately on your way to the urinal. Okay. And then, um, because we've uh, been given this property here kind of on the corner, and the Lord's blessed us, and we've used almost most of the property to the north side for parking. Um, and we have a school starting, which, by the way, I think tentatively they've got 18 students for the upcoming school year for Libertas uh, School. Yeah. Um, we've, we've always wanted to purchase the less than friendly, friendly motel next to the parsonage over here. Um, and so by God's grace, over the last month, we were able to negotiate a price with the guy and uh, if you pray for us, the 5th of July, we're supposed to close on the friendly, and that'll be uh, more friendly when we own it. <laughs> yeah, so. Okay, all that said, let's go to Jeremiah 37. And uh, today we're going to talk about the double-mindedness of King Zedekiah. And uh, I don't know if I've told you this before, but if I haven't, uh, then you might want to write this down, Jeremiah does not write chronologically. Uh, he's a thematic guy. He writes in themes. So uh, in chapter 36 last week, we had a narrative that fell under uh, the third to last king, uh, Jehoiakim. He reigned for 11 years. And so what happened last week fell under that period of time. Uh, the chapters before that fell under the last king, Zedekiah. So we went from Zedekiah, the last king, to the third last king, or the third to last king, and then uh, today back to Zedekiah, the last king again. And in fact, the next three chapters, chapter 37, chapter 38, chapter 39, they all fall under the last king of Israel, Zedekiah's reign. And to be more specific, they fall in the last 18 months of his reign, at least uh, this portion does that we're going to look at today. So you need to understand that for us to have a bearing on where we're at in the nation's history. The city is surrounded by the Babylonians, and uh, they will essentially be there for the most part until the fall of Jerusalem in 586 B.C., August. So verse 1 of chapter 37 now, King Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, reigned instead of uh, Jeconiah or Coniah, the son of Jehoiakim. So it was Jehoiakim, last week's king, third to last king. Uh, his son Coniah reigned for three months, second to last king. And then Nebuchadnezzar installed a king uh, named Zedekiah. He was a vassal king. 
He's a king that uh, was just put there to give tribute to Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, and do what Nebuchadnezzar wanted. So he made him king of Judah. But neither he, that's Zedekiah, nor his servants, verse 2, nor the people of the land gave heed to the words of the Lord, which were spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. And so Zedekiah the king sent uh, Juhakal, the son of Shelemiah, and Zephaniah, the son of Maasiah, to the priest, or the priest, uh, to the prophet Jeremiah. He sent this, this contingency of folks to the prophet Jeremiah, and he said, Pray now to the Lord our God for us. Now Jeremiah was coming and going among the people, for they had not yet put him in prison. So he was in prison last week under uh, King Jehoiakim. He's going to be in prison again, we're going to see, uh, under King Zedekiah a couple times. So right now he's free. And then Pharaoh's army, this is Pharaoh Hophra, came up uh, from Egypt. And uh, when the Chaldeans, that is the Babylonians, who were besieging Jerusalem, heard the news of them, they departed from Jerusalem. And then the word of the Lord came to the prophet Jeremiah, saying, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Thus you shall say to the king of Judah, who sent you to me to inquire of me. Behold, Pharaoh's army, which has come up to help you, will return to Egypt uh, to their own land. And the Chaldeans, that is the Babylonians, shall come back and fight against the city and take it and burn it with fire. And thus says the Lord, do not deceive yourselves, saying the Chaldeans will surely depart from us, for they will not depart. For though you had defeated the whole army of the Chaldeans who fight against you, and there remained only wounded men among them, they would rise up, every man in his tent, and burn the city with fire. Now here we have uh, a double-minded man, you might call him a vacillating vassal. He was Zedekiah, not a strong man. And he is put into place at a time where Judah needed strong leadership. He's a very small man on a very big stage. Now, the Babylonian siege starts in 588 B.C. It will last till, as I told you, uh, the fall of 586 B.C. when they'll finally take the city and burn it to the ground and take off nearly a million people captive. Now, Zedekiah is an interesting guy because he's been told by Jeremiah multiple times this is what's going to happen because of his hard heart, because of the hard heart of the people. But he is a very weak-minded man, and it shows in this sense that he will, from time to time, twice in this chapter, seek Jeremiah privately because he understands Jeremiah does have an ear to the Lord. He recognizes in his heart that Jeremiah is right and all the other prophets are wrong. The problem is he's so weak, he doesn't want to believe what Jeremiah is saying. He's hoping he'll get a different word out of him. And he's too weak to stand up to his peers, if you will, even though they're princes, they're not the king. Uh, since he was put in place, he has no strength, so he caves publicly and he'll turn against Jeremiah publicly while he seeks him privately. Now, in this case, the circumstances have changed just a little bit. In chapter 34, if you remember, the Lord had let us know that the Babylonians did leave for just a bit, as is recorded in this chapter, to go fight Egypt. What happened was Zedekiah reached out to Egypt as an ally. Egypt came to help the besieged Jerusalem. And so as Pharaoh Hophra comes into Israel... Nebuchadnezzar breaks the siege, and he leaves to fend off Egypt. Well, we understand that while they were besieged from chapter 34, Zedekiah, the king of Judah, had said, boy, let's get God's heart. Let's do right. And so he had made a decree to set all the slaves free, if you remember. But as soon as the siege broke, they thought, oh, God listened to us, and now Babylon's actually going to return, so let's enslave everybody again. Let's go right back to business as usual. And so, of course, Jeremiah was called to speak against that. Well, this is during that time. And what happens is the circumstances have changed so that Zedekiah is hoping that all Jeremiah has said 
is not true, and he's calling him to see if God will give him a different word. Maybe this means that God's told Jeremiah, yes, indeed, Babylon is leaving. But here's what I want you to understand. The circumstances have changed, but the word of God has not changed. That is always true. And God will give us a word, by the way, and he will ask us to do something, which in this case, he's saying, if you don't repent, this is what's going to happen. And since they did not repent, the word of God has not changed. If we don't do the first word, we'll never get a second word. And interestingly enough, Zedekiah, he did not want to obey the Lord, but he did indeed want the Lord's help. And when I look at Zedekiah, I think there's a little Zedekiah in me, <laughs> and there's probably a little Zedekiah in all of us. Like, I don't really always want to do what God wants me to do, but I sure would like his help when I'm in a pinch. And so that's the setup. The problem is that when a person knows the word of God, like Zedekiah did, and he doesn't do anything with it, Proverbs chapter 28 verse 9 says, God detests the prayers of that person who ignores his word. He'll more than likely hear the prayers of somebody who doesn't know his word than he will somebody who knows his word and ignores it because we have a different relationship there, a different way of understanding, a different experience. So here's the situation, and then this sets up verse 11. Now it happened when the army of the Chaldeans left the siege of Jerusalem for Pharaoh's army that Jeremiah went out of Jerusalem to go into the land of Benjamin to claim the property there among the people. If you remember, he bought a piece of property in chapter 32 while the place was besieged, and now he's going to see his people to claim his property. And when he was in the gate of Benjamin, that's the gate in Jerusalem that leads out towards the land of Benjamin where he was from, a captain of the guard was there whose name was Erijah, the son of Shelemiah, the son of Hananiah, and he seized Jeremiah the prophet, and he said, you are defecting to the Chaldeans. Now, hold on just a second, because Jeremiah is accused of trying to escape from or to go AWOL so that he can defect to the Chaldeans. So the siege is temporarily lifted. He wants to go take care of business. He's just going to go to his hometown, claim his property, see his people. And this guy accuses him. He's obviously been waiting for Jeremiah to do something wrong. Well, why would that be? Glad you asked. In chapter 28, verses 16 and 17, if you'll remember, in chapter 28, we were confronted with this guy named Hananiah. And he gives this fancy prophecy where he's got a yoke and he says, God's going to break the yoke of the Babylonians over Jerusalem. And he's going to set you free. And Jeremiah said, since you gave such an awful prophecy of blasphemy, you're going to die. And the next month, he died in chapter 28, 16, and 17. Look here. This is most likely his grandson, Arijah, and he's ticked off that God had spoken against his granddad, and he died in front of everybody. So he's been watching Jeremiah. He's been blaming Jeremiah. So now he says, you're defecting. And Jeremiah says, false. <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm not defecting to the Chaldeans. But he did not listen to him. So Elijah seized him and he brought him to the princes. And therefore the princes were angry with Jeremiah and they struck him and they put him in prison in the house of Jonathan the scribe for they had made that a prison. And then Jeremiah, when he entered the dungeon in the cells, he stayed there many days. So Jeremiah is accused of defecting to the enemy. Now here's the interesting thing. In Hananiah's defense, Jeremiah had, as I have there for you, in chapter 21, verse 9, said to the people, Babylon is going to take this city. And the only way you can escape is to leave and go with them. He said, God has given this city into the hands of wicked Babylon, and if you remain in the city, you'll die. But if you'll defect to them before they take the city, you'll live. Now, you got, you got to think about uh, politically how this would have shook out. This, this is if Iran takes America, and they besiege Farmington, and I get up on a Sunday morning, and I tell you faithful, guess what? 
America, founded on God's principles, we've gone so far that God has given us to Iran. And God says to you, if you'll defect to Iran, if you'll leave and defect to Iran and submit yourself to a Muslim nation, guess what? You'll live. But if you stay here and try to follow God and try to reclaim what you've had, you'll die. Now, how do you think that would go over for me here in Farmington? This is the problem. Jeremiah has, because he's followed God, set him up for failure. His own life was put in jeopardy. So he's imprisoned. And he's not just thrown in any prison. He's thrown in a dungeon. Now, a dungeon or a cell, uh, it looks like this. If you go to Israel with us in 2024, we'll show you this kind of thing where in an arid area, they would build houses over these cisterns. So they'd dig a cistern, they'd build a house, and then when the rain would fall in the wet season, the rain would run into the cistern and it would essentially become a holding tank for fresh water. But as it would dry up, it would be mucky and muddy and uh, dark and damp. And so they would use these things then to double as prisons. So they threw him down in his pit. Uh, he's going to be thrown in another one in the next chapter. And uh, it's up to, you know, his armpits we're going to see. It's stinky. It's smelly. It's wet. It's cold. It's dark. It's full of bugs. There he is imprisoned. And by the way, Mark Chagall is one of my favorite painters. He's a Jewish painter, and he paints all these images of the Old Testament. That's him with Jeremiah in the prison. I don't know if it looks quite that angelic for Jeremiah, but I do love the idea that there he is alone, right? Bound imprisoned, but God is uh, with them as we're going to see. And so, verse 17, then Zedekiah the king sent and took him out, and the king asked him secretly, there's that word again, secretly in his house, and said, is there any word from the Lord? Now, now imagine this, Je Jeremiah's in prison, the king sneaks him out, and the king's like, maybe one last time there'll be a different word from the Lord. And, and Jeremiah says, there is. Can you imagine the king? It's like, all right, finally, after all of this time, Jeremiah is always prophesying doom. There's going to be a good word. Jeremiah says, there is. You shall be delivered into the hand of Babylon. King, it's the same word it's always been. And then Jeremiah says to King Zedekiah, what offense have I committed against you and against your servants or against this people that you put me in prison? Where now are all the prophets that prophesied to you, saying the king of Babylon will never come against you in this land? Therefore, please hear now, O my lord, the king. Please let my petition be accepted before you, and do not make me return to the house of Jonathan the scribe, lest I die there. And then the king, Zedekiah, commanded that they should commit Jeremiah to the court of the prison. That's a prison that's at least above ground. And that they should give him daily a piece of bread from the Baker Street, until all the bread of the city was gone. And thus Jeremiah remained in the court of the prison. Now, Zedekiah has a small amount of compassion on Jeremiah. And when you think about Jeremiah pleading for his life, this is a guy who knows how to take a beating. If there ever was a guy that suffered for the Lord, it's Jeremiah. I mean, he knows how to uh, swim upstream from culture. He's been ostracized from his family. He's been kicked out of the temple. He's been put in shackles. He's been mocked. And now he's been thrown in a dungeon, and it's so bad, this guy's like, please do not send me back there. I will not live. That's how bad it is. And so Jeremiah, he begs for his life, but interestingly enough, his word from the Lord did not change. And you got to think about this. Way, way back in chapter 17, he's told by God, don't pray for these people anymore. Their hearts are so hard, they're not going to change. So we don't have any word here in this chapter that Jeremiah ever actually prayed. He knew what was going to happen. He knew what was coming down the pike. And yet the Lord still spoke to him when the king would inquire of him. And Jeremiah would give the word of the Lord and it would remain unchanged even though his life was at stake. And so Zedekiah has a little compassion on the prophet Jeremiah, but again, he's going to reverse course next chapter, next week. 
And when the princes pressure him, he's going to throw Jeremiah back in the pit because he's like, I can't stand up against the princes. And what Zedekiah is a picture of, he's a picture of what James 1.8 says. Uh, my version would say, uh, the double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. But what we find is that uh, the New Living translates it, the double-minded man's loyalty is divided between God and the world, and they are unstable in everything they do. And you see what the scripture implores us, especially throughout the New Testament, is to, uh, at least in my translation, it's uh, 2 Corinthians 1.12, it's, it's simplicity and sincerity. And the word simplicity is actually single-mindedness. It's to keep your mind focused on God, and any time there's a crux between the world and the Lord, it should be uh, automatic default, I'm going to side uh, with God. Single-minded. And I'm not going to fluctuate. And the people that know me should know me and know when it comes to this or that, if it's dealing with the Lord, that person is going to know that I'm going to side with the Lord. I'm single-minded in that direction. You might say, well, he's simple. Christians get accused of that, right? God's a crutch. Absolutely, God's a crutch for me. He's more than that. Like, I'm simple in the fact that when it comes to need, I'm going to rely upon the Lord and not the things of this world. And so... Jeremiah is completely different. He's single-minded than the double-minded Zedekiah. Now, don't swap your Bible's clothes, whap, like this. Don't turn off your idle phones or start surfing on the Internet, because what I want to do is this. For about the next 15 to 20 minutes, I want to take a look at Zedekiah, the vacillating vassal. What do we learn from this guy? And the first thing I want to share with you is that we learn from him that weak character I put usually, but I'd say almost always leads to wicked character. And I want to illustrate this by uh, Judas. So if you go to John chapter 12, you read about Judas towards the end of Jesus' ministry in verse 1, that six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus was, who had been dead and whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Now, by the way, when you read through your Bible, uh, it's important to know just a little Hebrew because it helps you understand things. When you're reading the names of places, Beth is a prefix that means uh, house. So like Bethlehem, Bethlehem, where Jesus was born, house of bread. I am the bread of life. He was born in a house of bread. Pretty cool, huh? Uh, when you come to Bethany, Bethany means house of the poor. It's where Lazarus was, his sisters Martha and Mary. So when Mary is going to break the oil over Jesus' feet, she did it in the house of the poor. She was giving everything she had. And so there Martha made him supper, verse 2. And then verse 3, Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, and he anointed, she anointed Jesus' feet, and she wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of oil. But one of his disciples, who is it? Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him said, why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? This, John writes, he said, not because he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and he had the money box and he used to take it and, uh, and take what was in it for his own good. He used to take out of it and steal from it. But Jesus said, hey, let her alone. She has kept this uh, for the day of my burial. She understands something about me that you guys don't understand. For the poor you will have with you always, but me you do not always have with you. Now, here's Judas Iscariot. Like Zedekiah, he's a weak-minded guy. He has weak character, you might say. But there are some who uh, I think fall on the hyper- Calvinistic, hyper-election, hyper-predestination side of things, it would say Judas was just picked from the beginning of time to betray Jesus, and so he, he was always what he was going to be. This just proves what he was going to be, and he never had a chance. He was the son of perdition. But I think if you read Scripture, you find a whole different uh, narrative in that Judas was a man of weak character that Jesus picked and gave every opportunity to become everything that he could have been. And Judas is a pretty special guy in a sense that he's obviously the most educated of all the apostles. He's the guy with the money bag, so it also assumes that he was the most trusted of all the apostles. 
When they start looking around at the Lord's Supper and trying to figure out who will betray Jesus, nobody suggests Judas. And by the way, Judas is the guy who, if you know the seating at the Lord's Supper, he's at the guest of honor position with Jesus. So here's Jesus giving him the money bag when he knows he's weak when it comes to money. That's a chance for him to develop character. Instead, he fails. Here's Jesus giving him the position of honor at the Lord's Supper when he knows Judas is a prideful man and he gives him the opportunity to break his weak character, but instead Judas fails. Then Jesus washes his feet just a couple hours before he's going to betray him, knowing that Judas could never do this because he's too prideful and he's too dishonest. Then when the soldiers come with Judas to identify Jesus, and I know I've shared this with you. I was telling the people this in Israel. I love this. Uh, you know that with the burial spices they put in Jesus' tomb, that uh, Jesus, if you do the math on how they used burial spices for poundage, Jesus was about probably 180 to 200 pounds, and the average male was five foot two back then. So Jesus was a little portly Jesus. You know, he was a little, probably had him a ball. Like when they saw him and, and he said, you know, before Abraham uh, was I am, they said, well, how could you know Abraham? You're, you're not even 50 years old. They didn't say you aren't even 30 years old. Like he didn't age well because he had a hard life. So here's like balding skull at Jesus with, um, with, you know, dark complexion, not white. And then he's a little bit square, you know, but the, that doesn't work well on the cross in the Western culture. Like you can't have portly Jesus on the cross in a loincloth. You've got to have six pack Jesus. Um, so just the, the thing is, that's why Judas had to kiss him. The, the Bible said there was no comeliness about him. Like people didn't, didn't say, oh, there's the Messiah. That guy looks like a Messiah. They couldn't even recognize him in a crowd. Judas comes up to kiss him to show them which one was him, and he calls him friend. Like here's a guy who takes a person with weak character and gives him every opportunity and sets him up in circumstances where he can build character. But if you don't do that, what will happen is that character will always go from weak to wicked. And I'll tell you what, the same is true in a Christian life. What happens in Christianity is whether churches become legalistic and people think, well, I can't do this, or somebody look down on me, or you end up being in a church where somebody says something mean to you because you wear the wrong thing or you listen to the wrong thing, or it's, it, so you start to put up a facade. Like, I, and instead of me changing this thing that God's probably wanting me to change, I'll put up a facade. I, I won't really change weakness. I don't really want to get rid of that thing. Whatever you don't get rid of or whatever thing you don't do in faith that God wants you to do, that weak character will eventually turn into a wicked spot, a rotten spot in your life. It's always true. This is the case with Zedekiah, who didn't know the Lord at all, it appears. But it's also the case with, um, with Judas Iscariot. Now, secondly, um, a person can have a good deal of religion yet not enough to transform or mold their life. This is the case with Zedekiah. He knows the word of God. He's been told the word of God by the prophet of God, but it doesn't change his life. Now, this is very, very important. Uh, religion actually means, by definition, to relink or to reconnect. That's the root word. So every person is incurably religious. Even though uh, we live in a post-atheist culture, not a post-Christian culture, the atheist is just as religious as you or I because God has put eternity in every person's heart is what Ecclesiastes says, and everybody is searching for the answers that plague them to life. Uh, is there a purpose? Is there a creator? Uh, why do good things happen to bad people and bad things seem to happen to good people? Um, you know, I don't, I don't understand this and that, and I'm searching. So what happens is man starts to relink. And uh, whether you're searching through gods or through pleasure or through secular humanism uh, or through Christianity, which is the only true religion, man is always desiring to relink. Now, the problem is you can have a lot of religion, like even true religion, and it never make it, as you've heard, that 18 inches between your 
your head and your heart, and then you don't have enough to mold your life. And the best example outside of a guy like Zedekiah is actually found um, in Genesis, but I want to read the Hebrew narrative because in chapter 12 of Hebrews, the writer is trying to get you to understand what true religion looks like. And it's tricky, right? Because the person that knows the Lord often can look worse than a person who doesn't know the Lord. And by the standards of culture or tradition, you might look at somebody and say, that guy or that gal, they know the Lord. Like they've got good values. They've got great character. And then you might look over here and say, that person absolutely must not because they're weak character or they don't get it right. And the odd thing is, uh, the spirit is the one who searches the heart because it could be way more than the eye sees. And so in verse 14 of Hebrews 12, the writer says, pursue peace with all people and notice holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Uh, if you don't have holiness, if you're not set apart as a Christian, if you're not growing in what's called sanctification, the Bible says, watch out. You don't know the Lord. You won't see him. The Lord sets you apart. And so then he says, looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness spring up and cause trouble. And by this, many become defiled. Lest there be any, notice, fornicator or profane person like Esau, who sold for one morsel of food his birthright. For you know that afterward, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, that he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. Now, I want to tell you a little story here real quick about Jacob and Esau. Some of you know this from Genesis, but Isaac and Rebekah can't have children. Isaac is the one and only handpicked son of Abraham by God, miraculous. And he's going to be the father of many nations, although he can't have children. So Isaac pleads for his wife. He actually cries tears for his wife to have children. And God gives Rebecca conception. And as she's carrying the child, she feels this rumbling in her tummy. And she says, what's going on? And God says, well, you've actually got two in there. You got twins. And it's it's not just two children, it's two nations, and they're never going to get along. They're fighting in the womb. Now, can you imagine this? You've been waiting years to have children, and God says, I'm going to give you exactly what you wanted, and they're going to hate each other. So when they come out, the first one pops out, and uh, they named kids often either by prophetic names, what they hoped for, or what they saw as soon as they came out of the womb, and as you know, this one comes out, and the dude's so hairy, they name him Harry, which is Esau, right? But when he comes out, the, the second one, the younger one, uh, Jacob, he's trying to pull the heel. You know, he's, trying, he's like wanting to be first. And interestingly enough, when God told Rebecca she was going to have kids, they said there's two nations in there, and that, that older one's going to serve the younger one, which is completely upside down in culture. So here's, here's little Jacob. They name him Jacob because it means deceiver or heel catcher. So he's trying to pull his brother back in so he can be first. So all this, I mean, what's that going to look like on video camera? You know, so this deal's going on. They, they find, so they, they come out, they start growing. They don't get along. Now, here's the interesting thing. R Rebecca knows this prophecy. And you know who else knows this prophecy? Isaac. But you know how it is that most of the time in a marriage, the wife is more spiritual than the husband. And so the Bible is beautiful at depicting uh, life and family like it is. If your family's messed up, you're just like this family. Because uh, here's how it works. Uh, Isaac, by tradition, still loves Esau more. Esau's his guy. Firstborn, you're supposed to love the firstborn more. Uh, guess what? He's a man of the field. He's a man's man. He's hairy. He also can kill game, and uh, he's kind of stand up. Like if you're looking for a patriarch, this is the guy. Jacob, kind of a mama's boy. I know you're not supposed to say that in 2021, 2022, 2023, this era, but he was a mama's boy. He's always at the house. It's like, I don't really like going outside. Kind of like it in the air conditions. And so, I, you know, Isaac doesn't care for him as much, but here's the thing. Because Isaac is stubborn and still chooses to bless his oldest son, the mom who's more spiritual becomes, uh, ever seen this? Dad's stubborn, 
and won't listen. Mom is quieter yet controlling. So she's trying to manipulate the whole situation. So she's coaching up her younger son. We got to take this thing. Like dad's, hey, dad's a good guy, but he's a little dense when it comes to Jesus. So what happens is when uh, Esau goes out to get game, he comes in famished, and the mom and Jacob, they've been watching this guy, and they know he's got some chinks in his game. So what Jacob does, because he's at the house, he's in the kitchen making him some red bean stew. And when Esau comes back, he goes, hey, you like some stew? Esau says, I'm so famished. I, I, I would do anything to get some of that stew. Jacob says, well, you know what you could do? You could give me your birthright. Would you give me your birthright? Now, the birthright is this. It's the spiritual and practical responsibility, the headship of the family handed down. Like as the firstborn, you get all the responsibility, but you also get kind of the status. But it was uh, connected to the Lord. It was uh, spiritual. It was also practical. Esau doesn't care anything about the spiritual. He doesn't care anything about the practical responsibility of running a family. He goes, shoot, yeah, you can have it. So Jacob buys the birthright that Esau cares nothing about for a pot of red stew. Now, this is where God has a sense of humor. Esau will become a great nation. What is that nation? It's a nation named Edom. You know what Edom means? Red. He sold his birthright for a pot of red stew. God says your nation will be called red. In fact, it's red, red, double red. Now, all that said, we go on in life. Isaac is blind. He's about to pass off the scene in his mind. He goes, I got to get my sons in here and bless them. I'm, I'm going to kick the bucket, so I got to get in. And it's a big deal in this culture. I bless them, and God would actually use the prophetic blessing. So he calls in Esau, and he says, hey, bud, go out and make, kill something that I love to eat. Make me the stew I like. When you come in, I'll bless you. I'll give you, and this is the, what's, what's going on here, I'll give you the physical inheritance. You get the money. You get the double portion. You get everything you've been wanting. Esau rushes off. Guess who's listening? Rebecca. And she says, oh, your dad's about to blow it, stupid blind guy. You know, blind old man. No, she's not that disrespectful. But she says, look, we got to help, the, we gotta help God out here. Here's what we're going to do. So go uh, get in the kitchen again, make some stew. And then what I want you to do is go kill a goat, put the goat hair on your arms. And then I want you to go feed your dad this stew, and we'll trick him into thinking it's Esau. So in goes Jacob. I mean, how hairy is this guy? And, uh, and Isaac, he can't see, and he's rubbing. He said, like, show me. He's like, the voice is, the voice is, is Jacob, but the, uh, give me your arms. The arms are Esau's. Like he's running his creepy his arms up and down. So he says, and the stew's good. He goes, okay. You know, and he knows something's going on. But he's, he's, he said, okay, I'll go ahead and bless you. Blesses him, gives him the blessing. You know, Jacob skips off, and about that time, here comes Esau back in. And then Isaac realizes, like, should have went with my instincts. And he says, I'm sorry, son, I already gave your blessing to that heel catcher, Jacob. And Esau starts screaming out, crying, oh, bless me, bless me, isn't there any blessing for me? And he gets a blessing. Not the one he wants, but what we find here is he never really repented. He was just remorseful that he didn't value what God had said. And so he gave away his birthright. Therefore, he forfeited his blessing. Now, you might say to yourself, who is the better guy in this story? I mean, if I'm reading this story, Esau is a better guy than Jacob. How is Jacob, in fact, do you know this, that Malachi says of those two, God said, Jacob have I loved, Esau I have hated. And by the way, I want to tell you this, and, and this is important. This is why we're starting to get Christianity all wrong in America for sure. God, have you ever heard this, this saying, God hates the uh, sin, but he loves the sinner. That is the deepest lie from the pit of hell. God hates the sinner. God hates the sinner. Read it in your Bible. Go to Psalm chapter 4, verses 4 and 5. Go to Psalm chapter 11, verse 5. God hates the sinner. He hates the sinner to the core of his being. When you have a baby and that baby comes out of the womb, God hates that baby. 
You know why? Because that baby has a sin nature, a nature. And they will grow up and they will prove that sin nature by sinning. Only by God's grace does he give people the ability to learn and grow and come to the understanding of God. You say, well, how can God hate like that? How can, because he's a holy God. His eyes are too pure even to look upon evil. He gives man the opportunity to make a free choice. He creates man for fellowship in a perfect situation. Man forfeits that fellowship. Therefore, they break their relationship with God. Now God hates man. But what does God do? He doesn't leave man in that situation from the garden we have the proto-evangelium in Genesis chapter 3 that the seed of the woman will actually crush the seed of the serpent. He sent his son to step on the head of the serpent who bruised mankind. And so throughout Scripture, what you have is this story that man is incurably broken and we're all headed for hell without a Savior. But because of God's general grace, he gives people that he hates the opportunity to grow and learn and come to the knowledge of Christ who the light of the world is shown into the heart of every man, according to John 1. And then here's the beautiful thing. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son to live as a perfect man so he could die in the place of man and take the penalty of death, yet rise again and defeat death for any man who would put his trust in Jesus Christ. Therefore, they shall not perish, but they shall have what? Everlasting life. If you start with the premise that man is pretty good, you get the whole wrong outcome because man is not good. And you know Esau proves this. You know why? You say, poor Esau, if he could have just had a better situation, if his parents hadn't been so jacked up, what a messy family. If he hadn't have been picked by God to fail. But the truth is, it says here that Esau is a fornicator and he's a profane man and he proved it because as soon as his blessing was given away, he went out in Genesis chapter 28, says he picked Canaanite women to marry so it would tick off his parents. He proved what he was by his actions, but God gave him every opportunity. And so a person can have a good deal of religion and it can never shape or mold their life. Religion never saved anybody unless it's the religion of Christianity that has a relationship with Jesus Christ at his core. And God has done everything he needs to do for us to have that. That's the narrative of the Bible. Now, uh, thirdly, and we'll move quicker so we don't lose you guys completely. God's love is so patient. I mean, you look at Zedekiah. Jeremiah is a thorn in his side, but Jeremiah is actually a picture of God's patience. Jeremiah is hard-headed. Jeremiah has uh, a hard-headed ministry to Zedekiah. Zedekiah uh, will not change. Zedekiah is weak-minded. And this hard-headed guy just keeps telling him, here's God's word, here's God's word, here's God's word. And if God didn't love Zedekiah, he would have just taken him out year one, not year 11. And I, I remember uh, George Whitfield, who was a big-time pastor in the 1700s in America. Uh, he used to do these crazy open-air revivals with 10,000 people out in a field, you know, before you had megaphones or uh, microphones. And... Um, and he said, after preaching hellfire and brimstone for many years, he read the verse that I have up here for you, Romans chapter 2, verse 4. And he said it was then that he realized uh, something, that he could catch a lot more flies with honey than with vinegar. And it came to him that while people need to know what they're saved from, saved from hell, the truth is that most people don't continue on to much maturity if they only became a Christian because they were saved from hell. But they need to understand what they've been saved to and how good God is. In Romans chapter 2, my Bible says, Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, his forbearance, his long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? Or as it says up here, don't you see how wonderful and kind and tolerant and patient God is? And in his kindness, he gives it's intended to bring you to Christ. God is having every day patience on us and grace on us and kindness on us. And he wants us to use that to bring ourselves by his grace to himself, to Christ. Now, finally, in the case of Zedekiah, you could look and go, why God did you allow this to go on this long? Um, and Zedekiah unfortunately was hoping that God's patience was his acceptance of their situation 
Or some people would think, you know, God hasn't done anything. It must be his apathy. You've been for years prophesying that we're going to fall, but we're still here, right? And yet God's patience is never his acceptance or his apathy. If he gives a word, it will come true. And Peter writes of this in 2 Peter chapter 3 concerning judgment on the world. And he says this, verse 7 of 2 Peter 3, But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, the same word where God actually judged the world by the flood in Genesis and then gave the rainbow to say he would never judge the world by the flood again. The world will be judged again, but it will be by fire. It's reserved until the day of judgment and perdition or the, the cancellation is the idea, the destruction of ungodly men. In verse 9, concerning this, the Lord is not slack or slow concerning his promise, as some count slackness or slowness but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now, here's the interesting thing. As the days get darker, and the Bible says they will, um, the natural response of the Christian typically is, oh my gosh, why is it getting so awful? And to complain about it, and to be upset about it, and to cry about it, and to lament about it, and to go on Facebook, and on the book of faith, put all kinds of crazy posts about it, and to be less loving towards the unloving, because unloving people are getting harder to love. I don't know if you've noticed that. I'm getting more lovable. Other people are getting less lovable. Um, and you may look around and go, God, why don't you do something, right? By the way, when we ask God, why don't you do something, remember the Jeremiah and Zedekiah story because you might not like what God does. But typically, uh, what God does is he waits. Have you noticed this? God's got way more patience than you and I. And why is it? It's not because he's accepting of what's going on. When you look in our culture, and you go, this is just go like, and especially the older you are, the more you have it uh, to compare to, Right? So if you grew up in the 50s, you really are struggling with today because you've had way more time than I've had to compare the degradation of our culture to what was to what is. But, but the truth is you say, why won't it go back to this? Well, probably that wasn't as good as you remember. Probably wasn't as good as God wanted it to be even back then. But here's the other thing. It's not that, that he wants it to go back to this or that. He, he's, he's giving people running headlong towards hell, the opportunity to turn till the very last minute. And he's not nearly so concerned with national correctness as we are. What he loves is the heart individually and people corporately. And what he's doing is he's letting people have every last moment before they are going to be put in hell forever. So when God is tolerant with wickedness, it's not because he's okay with it. It's because he knows these people are so hard-hearted, I'm going to give them every last chance. And that's what we're experiencing. A God who loves people so much, he's let them send themselves into a place where they will not repent. Only then will he judge them. Past that, I want to read you one last scripture from 2 Corinthians chapter 6. As the days get darker, as judgment gets closer, as God's patience is so frustrating, as the lines get blurred politically and spiritually and relationally, then 2 Corinthians chapter 6, starting in verse 1, Paul would write to a confused generation, We then as workers together with him also plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, verse 2, In the acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. Here's the call. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. And Lord Jesus, we pray that you would take our weak-mindedness and our religion that isn't relationship. We pray that you would take our lack of patience, uh, our, our, our inability to appreciate your patience. And Lord, we pray that you would impress upon our heart our own place. And then, Lord, help us to fall at your feet and give us the things that you desire 
for us to give you so that we could be complete. For some that may be salvation and Lord that for others may be uh, salvation renewed, restored, reinvigorated. And Lord, we thank you for how you let us look into people's lives and we see exactly what's at stake, Lord. And so we thank you for your love in spite of you being a God who too pure to even look upon sin, you deal with sinners and dwell with sinners and strive with us for our own good and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Why don't you guys stand? We'll do one last song. Thank you.